Okay, we're back live yet again on the Hoplite channel. I am your host, Hop, and you are here to see part three of Karl von Clausewitz on War, The Revenge of the Sith. Nope, it's not going to be that movie. Hopefully it'll be better than that. Ooh, sick burn. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, we're here uh, for the third part on my four-part series for Karl von Clausewitz's On War. If you're coming here from uh, parts two and from parts one, appreciate you, watch, uh, appreciate you watching those two. Um, hopefully uh, you enjoyed them. If you haven't watched the first two parts, this is kind of a non-sequential book, so there's no harm in watching this first. Although I do recommend you go back and watch uh, parts one and two. Uh, it'll give you some perspective and some context. But nevertheless, we're here from part three. So yeah, uh, I won't dilly-dally and we'll jump into some history uh, and uh, further readings uh, themselves from the book on war. So uh, in parts one and two, I talked about uh, some brief uh, bio history for Karl von Clausewitz and the age in which he lived. And the foundation for his book on war uh, was obviously a topic of war, uh, but more importantly, his experience with the nature of war and that experience having come from his his lived experience during the French Revolutionary Wars. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, that time uh, in France uh, and maybe how the, the period in which von Clausewitz lived uh, gave him the inspiration and um, the motivation uh, to write his famous work. So what were the French, French Revolutionary Wars? Well, we know uh, it was a war that uh, lasted uh, roughly 1792 to 1802. So it wasn't short by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and it involved, uh, obviously, France uh, against Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire. So yeah, uh, this is uh, more or less a world war uh, before the term even became uh, a thing. Uh, this was a world war that preceded uh, World War I by over 100 years. Uh, but it involved uh, all the major powers of Europe. We know that the first period of the French Revolutionary Wars took place between 1792 and 1797. This was the first coalition. And then the second period, or the second coalition, lasted from 1797 to 1802. So they're divided uh, into these two periods. And the wars began in Europe between the superpowers, but they stretched as far as Egypt and the Caribbean. So, yeah, like I said, it was essentially a world war before there is even a, such a name for a world war. Uh, but how did it begin? Well, as the name implies, the French Revolutionary Wars began in 1789 following the French Revolution. The French Revolution uh, took place shortly thereafter, the American Revolution, and it was based upon um, the, the discontent and the, um, the conditions of what France was during this time for the middle and uh, lower classes. So uh, the conditions uh, had become, in the, in the minds of the average French person, so poor for the middle class and the lower class that they were ready to overthrow the uh, monarchy in France because of the conditions in which those people were living. The middle class probably didn't have it so bad, but if you were lower middle class or lower class, it was more or less serfdom and it was pretty, it was brutal. Um, it being a serf or of the lower class in France this time, um, yeah, it, uh, it was more or less unbearable and it gave rise to a movement in France to overthrow uh, the reigning government. And uh, that's what happened. And it culminated in the storming of the Bastille. The Bastille being, um, the largest prison in France at the time uh, where uh, criminals of all stripes were kept, but in particular political prisoners. And it was raided and the prisoners were freed. And it was different from the American Revolution in, in the sense that it wasn't a colony trying to free itself from the oppression of a foreign empire, but more or less the lower class revolting against the upper class who they believed had wronged them for far too long. And these people were embodied in Louis XVI and uh, his wife, Queen Marie Antoinette. And everyone knows Marie Antoinette for that famous quote, let them eat cake, which was considered, you know, a you know, middle finger to the lower classes 
saying that, well, I'm, I'm a rich woman and I have all the, um, the, the fancy delicacies uh, available to me uh, to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So let the poor eat cake because I assume they have cake as I do. So it was more or less a, uh, a famous quote, perhaps misquoted to her, but nonetheless quoted to her, as though a woman who was so out of touch with the lower classes that she assumed they could eat cake just as easily as, 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 as she could. She had cake, so of course they had cake, but that's not how it worked, right? The monarchy had cake and all the nice things, um, all the delicacies and, and, and the cuisines that royalty have. The lower class, you know, they were lucky to scrounge together enough meat and potatoes to make it through the, the week. So with the French Revolution, Naturally, the revolutionaries took over and the nobility and the monarchy was imprisoned. But here's where things get tricky. In 1791, the foreign powers around France, which would have been Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire, convened. And the monarchs don't like it when the commoners decide to revolt and overthrow the monarchy. Because despite the differences these countries have, they have one thing in common, and that is royalty over commoner. That is nobility over peasantry. And when they find out that the commoners have overthrown their fellow, fellow nobles, it's a different dynamic, right? They don't care if uh, France and Great Britain wage war if the French nobility or monarchy declares it against the French nobility or, or the, the, great, uh, the, the English nobility and monarchy. That's a war of two monarchies. That's even. But when France is overthrown by the lower classes, the, the uh, English monarchy and nobility, they take note of that. And they say, well, that, that can't fly, right? We're above you. We're royal, we, we are royal blood, you're lower blood. So this is when, the, um, uh, Frederick, when Frederick uh, William II of Prussia, who was either the king or emperor of Prussia at the time, which is what, in Germany, met with Emperor Leopold II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. And these two men uh, discussed what to do about France, and they issued the Declaration of Pilnitz. And then they mobilized their troops and sent them to the French border. And the Declaration of Pilnitz was essentially a, uh, a notice to the French revolutionaries. Um, Marie Antoinette and her husband Louis XVI are not to be harmed in any way. Their children aren't to be harmed in any way, or their relatives and they should be quietly and peacefully restored to their thrones and resume power as is their birthright. So it was, this, it was more or less two nobles, two kings, two emperors telling the French revolutionaries, okay, knock it off, don't hurt anybody, uh, don't hurt anybody in addition to those you've hurt and put our fellow, fellow nobles uh, back on their seats of, um, of power. Uh, the French revolutionaries said, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think you get it. We're not really going to do that. Uh, we, we revolted for a reason. And then things got even stickier. Because in 1792, the French revolutionaries realized that William and Leopold meant business and that troops were still on the French border. So the longer they kept the monarchy or the nobility alive, the more risk they were of being... Uh, undermined and a counter-revolution could perhaps take place in France for those that were loyal to the royals. So a show trial was held, uh, it was quick, and Louis XVI uh, was uh, executed. He's the only French king or ruler in history to be executed. And I think he may be the only French king or ruler to have ever been um, guillotined. I think he might be the only ruler in history to have faced the guillotine. I could be wrong on that, but he was definitely the first uh, ruler in European history to be guillotined, and he's the only French ruler to be executed by his own people. So he's dead. Marie Antoinette, her trial's next. I think it lasts about the same amount of time. It's a couple days. It's a show trial. They just go through the motions. She's executed. Here's where it gets even worse, because when Frederick and Leopold met, it wasn't just two guys meeting to defend their fellow royals. Marie Antoinette was the sister of Emperor Leopold. So you can probably guess that it was Leopold who called this meeting with William 
and William, at the behest of Leopold, met and said, they're going to kill my sister. They're going to kill my brother-in-law. That sucks. You know, yeah, I wish I wish it could be different for him, but I, I can't watch my sister get her head chopped off. We have to stop this. They issued the Declaration of Pilnitz and they mobilized troops, perhaps to intimidate the French revolutionaries. And unfortunately, it has the opposite effect. It spooks them and it makes them believe that the Declaration is merely just the, the pretext of war. So they execute Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. But what happens as a result of that? Well, these two men and the coalition of countries, they declare war on France. Then things get even worse. You have the National Convention, which is the uh, kind of the proto-government set up by the French revolutionaries. And the National Convention was com comprised mostly of Jacobins. And Jacobins called themselves the Society of Friends. Well, who were they? Uh, they were pretty much communists. Yeah, they were pieces of crap. These, uh, the Jacobins uh, were essentially Marxist before Karl Marx even wrote Das Kapital or the Manifesto. Uh, they came up with an idea and they called it the Committee of Public Safety. Well, that sounds pretty nice, right? Sounds like it's the National Convention trying to keep the people safe, brought to you by the Society of Friends. Well, what happened after the Committee of Public Safety was formed? Uh, you had in France what was known as the Reign of Terror. And it was a period of intense political persecution where anybody who was suspected of being a loyalist to the old monarchy or perhaps a counter-revolutionary that was there on behalf of William or Leopold, uh, they were arrested, they were tried, and then they were guillotined as well. There's a French cartoon uh, during this time, and one of the uh, main figures in the convention and the Jacobins was a little pipsqueak of a man named Maximilien Robespierre. And he was largely behind the Jacobin movement and the Committee of Public Safety during the Reign of Terror. And the cartoon shows uh, Robespierre uh, ordering the executioner to guillotine himself. And, and the caption was, uh, uh, Robespierre's France, where literally he had had everyone guillotined and was now ordering the executioner to execute himself. That's how bad it was. Well, un eventually enough people had it with the Reign of Terror and the Jacobins and men like Robespierre. They were arrested, they were guillotined, and they started over. But while this was all going on, a very promising young man, a Corsican by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, he was rising through the ranks of the French military and he showed himself uh, quite capable of leading a large score of men and um, was famous among the French military for his victories and for his leadership. He took over the military, he took over command as the supreme commander of French forces, and it was Napoleon who was able to hold France together at the end of the French Revolutionary Wars. But unfortunately, he merely picked up where the French Revolutionary Wars left off, and then you had the Napoleonic Wars. He eventually loses, and that's that. But this is essentially the period in which another bright man who proved himself in the battlefield and in, in uh, intellectual thought, Karl von Clausewitz, this was the cauldron into which this man who was fighting on behalf of Prussia, this is where he got his education, this is where he was formed and molded. And in this period, this is, this is the context in which On War was written. So. The French Revolutionary Wars, crazy time to be alive. France between the years of 1792 and like 1815 was a complete disaster. I mean, it was, it was a dumpster fire caught inside of a you know, junkyard tire fire. It was bad news. You did not want to be in France or anywhere near it during this time, especially during the Reign of Terror. Okay, but now let us move to the book itself on war, Karl von Clausewitz. Part three, and we'll uh, do some selected readings here. I will give you the go-bys, as I always do, so that you can read as I read, and we will discuss. All right, let's jump to the first reading. This is on page 100. This is under the section, War is an Act of Human Intercourse. All right, and von Clausewitz wrote, We therefore conclude that war does not belong in the realm of arts and sciences. Rather, it is part of man's social existence. War is a clash between major interests, which is resolved by bloodshed. That is the only way in which it differs from other conflicts. 
Rather than comparing it to art, we can more accurately compare it to commerce, which is also a conflict of human interests and activities, and it is still closer to politics, which in turn may be considered as a kind of commerce on a larger scale. Politics, moreover, is the womb in which war develops, where it outlines already exist in their hidden rudimentary form, like the characteristics of living creatures in their embryos. Whoa, that's pretty deep, Carl. So what he's saying uh, is, um, you know, we know that The Art of War, written by Sun Tzu, is, is a famous work and it has that title, but von Clausewitz is saying um, war is more like um, a commerce, and commerce is essentially politics on a smaller scale. So you have politics, commerce, and war, and all of these three are related. Commerce is, I'm trying to sell something and make profits, and you're my competition, and I want to edge out the competition, perhaps in unsavory ways, but our battlefield is the marketplace. Politics, the battlefield is the court. It is essentially me trying to achieve power by convincing the people that I am a more worthy sovereign, a more worthy representative than you are. And war is more or less me extending my policies of politics to you or your country and making you see things my way. And that's exactly what happened here with Frederick, William, and Leopold. They issued the Declaration of Pilnitz telling the revolutionaries, you leave Louis and Marie alone, all right? And we're putting troops on your border just to let you know we mean business. The revolutionaries freak out. They think that war is imminent no matter what. They figure getting rid of Louis and Marie is what has to happen anyway, because if they're around, it just makes war a greater certainty. So they execute these two, and then war becomes a fait accompli. That's, that's politics uh, transgressing into, into war. And this political field right here possibly always had war on the horizon. It was just uncertain about you know, uh, when it would happen. But uh, the question of if, I think, once the Declaration of Pilnitz was, was issued, it's not a question of if anymore, it's just when is this war going to happen. And what von Clausewitz is saying is that, uh, it's a great quote here, politics is the womb in which war develops where, it out, where its outlines already exist in their hidden rudimentary form, like the characteristics of living creatures in their embryos. So we can see war beginning in the embryo here, right? It's taking form. We can see the baby has, has digits, and we can see it, its eyes, the outline of its head and its, and its body. The embryo of the war is this political situation. So it's more like politics and commerce, but on a grander scale. And through politics and commerce, you can see the embryo of war taking shape. It's, it's kind of twisted to like say that war is like childbirth, but in, in a way, that this, this is what gave birth to the French Revolutionary Wars was this condition. Okay, let's move on. And we jump to page 105. Von Clausewitz said, So long as no acceptable theory, no intelligent analysis of the conduct of war exists, routine methods will tend to take over even at the highest levels. Some of the men in command have not had the opportunities of self-improvement afforded by education and contact with the higher levels of society and government. They cannot cope with the impractical and contradictory arguments of theorists and critics, even though their common sense rejects them. Their only insights are those that have been gained by experience. For this reason, they prefer to use the means with which their experience has equipped them, even in cases that could and should be handled freely and individually. They will copy their supreme commander's favorite device, thus automatically creating a new routine. When we find generals under Frederick the Great using the so-called oblique order of battle, generals of the French Revolution using turning movements with a much extended front and commanders under Bonaparte attacking with a brutal rush of concentric masses, then we recognize in these repetitions a ready-made method and see that even the highest ranks are not above the influence of routine. Once an improved theory helps the study of the conduct of war and educates the mind and judgment of the senior commanders, routine methods will no longer reach so high. Those types of routine that must be considered indispensable will then at least be based on a theory rather than consistent sheer imitation. No matter how superbly a great commander operates, there is always a subjective element in his work. If he displays a certain style, it will in large part reflect his own personality, 
but that will not always blend with the personality of the man who copies that style. The danger is the very thing a theory should prevent by lucid rational criticism. When in 1806 the Prussian generals, Prince Louis at Saalfeld, Tautzen on the Dornberg near Jena, Grauert on the side of Kalpendorf and Ruckel on the other, plunged into the open jaws of disaster by using Frederick the Great's oblique order of battle. It was not just a case of a style that had outlived its usefulness, but the most extreme poverty of the imagination to which routine has ever led. The result was that the Prussian army under Hohenlohe was ruined more completely than any army has ever been ruined on the battlefield. Okay, so that was a longer passage, but what he's saying here is uh, theory and practice are very good bases for instructing young commanders and generals from which they should derive their own theories and practices. And when great generals like Frederick the Great or Bonaparte come up with their own styles and are successful, sometimes people will see this success by other great minds and simply imitate it. And they will consider that the formula for success. And what von Clausewitz is saying is that this will rise all the way from the lowest ranks into the, up, the highest ranks because everybody wants to succeed. And if they see someone else succeed, they will sometimes imitate that person even to a fault, assuming that this is the only formula for success because that's all they've seen. There are, there are difference between great minds and exceptional minds. Great minds can come up with theories but will fall back on routines because they know that's what works. Exceptional minds will follow theories, will imitate routines, but will never, never stick to routines as a matter of course, but sometimes develop their own styles, which later become someone else's routines. And that's the exceptional mind. When he says that's the military genius who can see what is going on, apply theories and routines, but think outside of that box when it calls for it. And what he says here is that um, the Prussian army under Hohenlohe, uh, they were ruined completely because he simply followed Frederick the Great's oblique order of battle. That worked for Frederick the Great in his time. But in this scenario, it didn't work. And in fact, it ruined the army so completely. No other army has been so devastated as Hohenlohe for doing what he did was imitation to the point of complete disaster. So military genius needs to understand that your own style and your own methods are what you must cultivate from theory and routine, but you never must imitate and follow routine because that is what you consider the formula for success. The formula for success today may not necessarily be the formula for tomorrow. And that's where the military genius will show himself when he can apply what he knows but then apply his own style when it's called for. All right, moving on. We go to jump, jump to page 125. And this is under chapter six. I'm sorry, we started 124. And von Clausewitz said, undoubtedly, the knowledge basic to the art of war is empirical. While for the most part, it is derived from the nature of things, this very nature is usually revealed to us only by experience. Its application, moreover, is modified by so many conditions that its effects can never be completely established merely from the nature of the means. The effects of gunpowder, that major agent of military activity, could only be demonstrated by experience. Experiments are still being conducted to study them more closely. It is, of course, obvious that an iron cannonball impelled by powder to the speed of 1,000 feet per second will smash any living creature in its path. One needs no experience to believe that. But there are hundreds of relevant details determining this effect, some of which can only be revealed empirically. Nor is the physical effect the only thing that matters. The psychological effect is what concerns us, and experience is the only means by which it can be established and appreciated. In the Middle Ages, firearms were a new invention, so crude that their physical effect was much less important than today, but their psychological impact was considerably greater. One has to have seen the steadfastness of one of the forces trained and led by Bonaparte in the course of his conquests, seeing them under fierce and unrelenting fire to get some sense of what can be accomplished by troops steeled by long experience of danger, in whom a proud record of victories 
has instilled the noble principle of placing the highest demands on themselves. As an idea alone, it is unbelievable. On the other hand, there are European armies that still have troops, such as Tartars, Cossacks, and Croats, whose ranks can easily be scattered by a few rounds of artillery. All right. So he's speaking more in practical terms here, and he's saying that the art of war still has much of its root in empirical data, meaning you can, you can take war and apply it uh, with uh, philosophical theorems, such as Sun Tzu would, but, and this is the German in Karl von Clausewitz saying, war is like any other uh, human endeavor. It can be understand, understood through empirical data. And he mentions the development of gunpowder and warfare in that you can propel a cannonball a thousand feet per second with gunpowder. Today we can, can, we can propel a cannonball probably four times faster than that. But that's what they had in their day and age. Even still, a 10 pound, 8 pound cannonball moving at that speed, nothing on this earth on four legs or two legs is going to still be standing when that thing comes rolling, uh, barreling through. You don't need evidence to support that. You just need to be able to see what the cannonball does and say, yeah, I believe that everything on this planet would die if it was in the way of that cannonball. But the psychological impact of artillery fire, of gunpowder, is harder to measure because it has what von Clausewitz is saying, the ability um, to test the steadfast, steadfastness of troops and you will find out who was properly trained under artillery fire and who still hasn't had proper training. And what he's saying here is Napoleon Bonaparte's forces have been exposed to enough artillery fire and gunfire to know what its physical effects were. So much so that they held their ground in particular situations because they knew despite the sound of the artillery, they could still get done what they needed to get done without significant risk of bodily harm. There was still risk, obviously, because there was artillery fire, but when untrained forces heard the sound of the artillery fire, they all scattered because they assumed that whatever they heard was coming to get them personally, as in there was a cannonball coming and it had their name on it. Whereas in truth, a cannonball fired into a group of soldiers, you probably had a 85, 90% chance of avoiding any significant damage from it. So you fought on. But the untrained troops, they had no experience with this. The empirical data of knowing what artillery could do was not yet instilled in their ranks. So the psychological effect of artillery still had significant impact upon those forces. But for well-trained forces like Bonaparte's, the empirical data, which was years and years of courage under fire, of artillery fire, had developed in them a sense of steadfastness of steel in their spine and this could only be observed by someone who knew as Bonaparte did that the troops could be trained to disregard the psychological forces of cannon fire and keep doing what they needed to do as soldiers despite uh, the presence of that risk but for soldiers that were untrained they had no such empirical data Therefore, everybody would scatter because they assumed that whatever was coming was, was going to get them. Okay, so the empirical data of psychological factors on the battlefield are much more, um, uh, what you would say, are, are much greater factors to take into consideration than the actual physical application of those factors, which would be artillery fire. The psychological impact is perhaps twice as important as the physical impact. I believe that's what he's saying. Okay, jumping now to page 32. This is in a new book under strategy. And von Clausewitz said, strategic theory must therefore study the engagement in terms of its possible results and of the moral and psychological forces that largely determine its course. Strategy, is the use of the engagement for the purpose of the war. The strategist must therefore define and aim for the entire operational side of the war that will be in accordance with its purpose. In other words, 
He will draft the plan of war, and the aim will determine the series of actions intended to achieve it. He will, in fact, shape the individual campaigns, and within these, decide on the individual engagements. Since most of these matters have to be based on assumptions that may not be proven correct, while other, more detailed orders cannot be determined in advance at all, it follows that the strategist must go on campaign himself. Detailed orders can then be given on the spot, allowing the general plan to be adjusted to the modifications that are continuously required. The strategist, in short, must maintain control throughout. Okay, so now he's getting more um, into the uh, nuts and bolts of strategy on the battlefield and what it means to be a strategist. So you have the overall war, right? The war is essentially all of the campaigns and all of those engagements summed up into one large conflict. You've got war, you've got the campaigns, and then you have the engagements. The strategy is how you use those engagements to win those individual campaigns. And then the strategy above the engagement level is how you use individual campaigns to win your overall war plan, that your strategy. And this is what the strategist must always take into account. I can afford to lose these engagements, but I must win these. I would like to win these engagements, but I can afford to lose half. If I lose these and I win these, I still win this overall campaign. If I win this campaign, but I lose this campaign, I could still win this war. If I lose that campaign, but win this one, the chances I will win this war drastically decrease. Maybe I have to win two out of three campaigns to win the war. Or maybe I only need to really win one out of the three campaigns to win the war. The strategist must always take into account the engagements, the campaigns, and then the overall war strategy. And he must do so with boots on the ground. And he's saying here, to be an effective strategist, you must be there to see your campaigns and your engagements in action and make detailed decisions on what must be changed or what must be maintained as you see the engagements and the campaign unfold. You cannot merely be a strategist uh, in a room somewhere looking over maps and moving pieces on the uh, chessboard. You move the chessboard pieces around and then you go out and you see the war for yourself and you make adjustments on the spot and thereafter in the strategy room. But you cannot run the war simply from the strategy room. That is all theoretical. That is, that is all planning and preparation. But when the actual combat takes place, the strategist must be there and must maintain control throughout from beginning to end. And that was von Clausewitz's, uh, that was his, um, his philosophy on how a strategist must take part in a war. He must be there through the whole planning and he must be there during the campaign itself to make decisions uh, as they need to be made as the conditions of the war change. Okay, he was a soldier's general, as they say. Okay, we'll move now to the next reading, which is on page 134. This is also a, a book three on strategy. And von Clausewitz wrote, a prince or a general can best demonstrate his genius by manning a campaign exactly to suit his objectives and his resources, doing neither too much nor too little. But the effects of genius show not so much in novel forms of actions as in the ultimate success of the whole. What we should admire is the accurate fulfillment of the unspoken assumptions, the smooth harmony of the whole activity, which only become evident in final success. The student who cannot discover this harmony in actions that lead up to a final success may be tempted to look for genius in places where it does not and cannot exist. Right. So as we, he said in the previous passage, the strategist must be there from beginning to end. And the prince or the general who employs the strategist or who is a strategist himself must look at the engagements and the campaigns as flowing together in one harmonious uh, piece of music, right? So you can't take one individual campaign loss or win as decisive unless it truly is decisive. Similarly, you cannot take an individual campaign win or loss as truly decisive unless the war is over and it is decisive. The student who goes looking for genius in other places where it cannot or does not or cannot or, or should not exist, uh, this is the student that is 
possibly trying to reinvent the wheel, but the wheel only has one form and one shape. The engagements are underneath the campaigns, the campaigns are underneath the war, and the strategy is how you have all of that flow into one harmonious uh, conclusion, which is victory. And the strategist must be in there from start to finish, but the final success, which you could say is the crescendo or the grand finale, the, the victory of the war, that should be the culmination of the harmony of the pieces of the notes that you have put together for the symphony in the conclusion of the war. That's military genius. Seeing the end goal and making all the parts in between, no matter how beautiful, how beautiful or ugly, work in concert together. That's the strategist's goal. Okay, next reading. We jump to page 139. This is under the twofold object of the engagement. And Van Clausewitz wrote, the possession of provinces, cities, fortresses, roads, bridges, munitions, etc., may be the immediate object of an engagement, but can never be the final one. Such acquisitions should always be regarded merely as means of gaining greater superiority, so that in the end we are able to offer an engagement to the enemy when he is in no position to accept it. These actions, actions should be considered as intermediate links, as steps leading to the operative principle, principle never as the operative principle itself. If we do not learn to regard a war and the separate campaigns of which it is composed as a chain of linked engagements, each leading to the next, but instead succumb to the idea that the capture of certain geographical points or the seizure of undefended provinces are of value in themselves, we are liable to regard them as windfall profits. In so doing and ignoring the fact that we are links in a continuous chain of events, we also ignore the possibility that their possession may later lead to def definite disadvantages. This mistake is illustrated again and again in military history. One could almost put the matter this way, just as a businessman can't take the profit from a single transaction and put it into a separate account, so an isolated advantage gained gain in war cannot be assessed separately from the overall result. A businessman must work on the basis of his total assets, and in the war, the advantages and disadvantages of a single action could only be determined by the final balance. Okay, I like that. I came up with the analogy of notes, as in notes comprising movements or pieces in a symphony. What von Clausewitz says is links in a chain, right? Losses and wins, retreats and routes. All of these are links in uh, a series of chains, and the chains go to lead you to victory in war. And he makes a, another great analogy here. Just as a businessman cannot profit from a single transaction and store that profit away in a separate account, so too must the general not take individual victories from any campaigns or engagements and tuck them away as feathers in his cap as though that's in and of itself a windfall profit. All the profits you make must later be used against deficits or losses, but the overall end balance, the final balance, as he said, the victory or the defeat in the war is all that matters. If you have a successful business, the profits are the engagements you won along the way. The profits you didn't realize or the inventory you lost, those were deficits or, or uh, debts against your credits that you had to counteract with the profits. And so long as the profits outweigh the deficits, you will have a final balance in the positive, in the black, and that will be a victory in a war. So a businessman must never look at individual profits as victories, the same as a general can't look at individual engagements or even individual campaigns as victories. The war is the final balance, the, the war is everything. And for a businessman, succeeding in business and uh, besting your competition and becoming the number one business in that territory, that is the overall goal, that is the overall victory, it's domination. And that's all war is, it's just to dominate. It's just, we win, you lose, we call the shots now. In business, my business won, your business lost, you tried to compete, I, out, I uh, outdid you, uh, now I call the shots. The final balance, okay. Last reading, here we go. Von Clausewitz, 
takes us to page 144, chapter 5, Military Virtues of the Army. And he says, No matter how clearly we see the citizen and the soldier in the same man, how strongly we conceive of war as the business of the entire nation, opposed diametrically to the pattern set by the conditieri of former times, the business of war will always remain individual and distinct. Consequently, for as long as they practice this activity, soldiers will think of themselves as members of a kind of guild, in whose regulations, laws, and customs the spirit of war is given pride of place. And that does, that does seem to be the case. No matter how much one may be inclined to take the most sophisticated view of war, it would be a serious mistake to underrate professional pride, the esprit de corps, as something that may, may and must be present in an army to greater or lesser degree. Professional pride is the bond between the various natural forces that activate military virtues. In the context of this professional pride, they crystallize more readily. An army that maintains its cohesion under the most murderous fire that cannot be shaken by imaginary fears and resists well-founded ones with all its might, that proud of its victories will not lose the strength to obey orders and its respect and trust for its officers even in defeat whose physical power, like the muscles of an athlete, has been steeled by training in privation and effort, a force that regards such efforts as a means to victory rather than a curse on its cause, that is mindful of all these duties and qualities by virtue of the single powerful idea of the honor of its arms. Such an army is imbued with the true military spirit. Well, that was pretty epic. Okay, yeah, so what he's saying here is that when you get down to it, right, when you get down to brass tacks, war is an individual enterprise in that the generals are ordering their field commanders to order their captains to inform their lieutenants to yell at their sergeants to kick their privates in the butt to go win this war. But when you get down to it, it's just the private, it's the individual, it's the low-ranking soldier with the fewest amount of stripes on his arm who has to fire his musket, drive his bayonet into some, some poor bastard, or light the cannon fuse and send some other poor bastards to his grave. It's an individual enterprise because those young men who are going are gonna to have to do that, that's an individual thing for them to have to carry out. It's their responsibility, ultimately, to take those actions and to make them happen. So how do you keep all of these young men together? Well, you're not going to do it with a sergeant kicking them in the ass, and you're not going to do it with a lieutenant screaming at them, and you're not going to do it with a general who gets to address them every so often and uh, you know, wax philosophic and give them uh, praise and lofty speeches. That's all well and good, but... What really holds an army together, and as von Clausewitz said, is the esprit de corps. That is the honor that these young men have to serve with each other, their brothers in arms, shoulder to shoulder, and to fight hard to keep the guy next to them alive or to save his life if it's in jeopardy. And this is the, the, the blue-collar military spirit that enables first world nations to organize young men under this esprit de corps and to win uh, great fame and great honor in wars such as the French Revolutionary War, the Napoleonic Wars, World War I and II, what have you. Von Clausewitz, despite being an officer, recognizes this fact. And it's great where he says that um, an army that maintains its cohesion under the most murderous fire that cannot be shaken by imaginary forces and resists well-founded ones with all its might Proud of his victories will not lose his strength to obey orders and its respect and trust for its officers even in defeat. This is essentially what, what he means by the military spirit is that murderous gunfire is coming down on them. Uh, de defeat and victory seem like far off distant lands, but it's, it's the military tradition, the spirit uh, among the individual that must take over. And if you don't foster this in your military, they won't follow orders. They will, they will scatter when murderous fire comes down on them uh, or, or when imaginary fears, such as the, the thundering of cannon fire from a battle being waged far off, sends shivers down their spines. It's, it's the military spirit that is the glue that will hold the rank and file together so that when it comes time for the individual to make the decision to wage war on behalf of his country, he will feel that spirit 
that camaraderie among his fellow soldiers and he will do his duty. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. That is, uh, that is it, folks, for On War Part 3. Um, I'm going to conclude the series here with Part 4. Hopefully it'll be the shortest of these three parts. I really, uh, I got to... I got to hand it to you. If you made it through uh, this part and the other uh, two parts, uh, your troopers, you're showing that esprit de corps for the Hoplite channel. Um, if I had a medal, I would, I would put it on your chest and I would give you a salute. So um, stick around. I'm going to wrap this up with part four and we'll send uh, Mr. Von Clausewitz, Commander Von Clausewitz, off with military honors uh, for giving us this fantastic work. Uh, and if you would, if you're enjoying this, please give it a thumbs up, uh, share with family or friends, uh, anyone who you think would enjoy this topic or the, um, uh, the readings. Uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, a lot more out of this book as I read it to you. And uh, I, learn, uh, I learn something new every day, even from something I read years ago. So, um, yeah, uh, I, uh, I once again want to thank you uh, for being here for part three. And uh, we'll see you next time for part four. Till then, take it easy.